So we wish Rebbe in the end a full recovery. Please, God, uh, hope Hashem bless us with good health and everything Amen. else. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, please, God. Amen. Guys, I'll I tell you what we're doing in review. Gavin actually impressed me last time because to at least take a stab at it was something. Arthur did impress me because he took a stab at it. It was just <laughs> he stabbed the wrong direction, but uh, at least he had the knife in hand and it was something. And uh, let's go through what uh, the two views are. So basically, the we're battling to see what the nuanced difference is between Rabbi Yehuda, who says the stolen animal returns as it is, uh, meaning that if the cow that has given birth or the ewe that has been shorn goes back to the original owner in its present state, the robber keeps the calf or the shorn wool because he's acquired it through the physical change of the byproduct and pays the original owner their previous value. Okay. And Rabbi Shimon says something a little bit, it seems cryptic, when it says we view it as if it was an article appraised and placed with him to its cash value at the time of the robbery. So um, if they're both saying, well, we're looking at the timeline of the robbery, depend, irrespective of the court date, it sounds as if they're very, very similar. So what's the difference between them? So Rav Zavid's opinion is, look, they are arguing with respect to improvements that are still attached to the stolen article. In other words, in the case of the Bryce itself, where the robber shared the ewe or the cow gave birth, there's no difference between them, guys. They both agree that when the byproduct is separated from the original article that was robbed, that the robber acquires it through that physical change and pays only the prior value. We did say that what is taken into account even according to Russia and the Rosh, where they disagree exactly how it works, is they do agree that that degree of hair growth, the wool growth that the U is paid for, even if it's not fully grown into an afro, and the fetal stage of prenatal development is paid, even though it's not a fully fledged calf. So that's pretty straightforward. There's no issue as far as that's concerned. We also said that Rashi holds that, in fact, that the animal be, can be made as a deposit back. And the only difference you have to make is that pregnancy stage from being non-pregnant or that slight extra wool stage in cash. But it has nothing to do with the fact that the robber won't make money on the byproduct of the calf because uh, there's a difference in value between the fetus at that pregnant stage and the calf as well as the uh, shorter wool and the longer wool. But that is acquired through physical change. But at least you can mimic the, st the time of the robbery and the crude value compared to a completely shaven you or a non-pregnant animal. Whereas the Rosh is saying, look, the physical animal itself has actually taken place, and therefore that's acquired in totality by the robber. Even if the item became separated in that particular case, the owner has to give the full value of the cash value of the calf at that stage of pregnancy or the you at that gr uh, growth point of wool development. Okay? But in principle, the two of them agree. But so there's no issue uh, as far as uh, where the byproduct is separated. They both agree that that belongs uh, to, uh, to the robber. Okay, at the at the timeline of the uh, robbery, the only thing that has to be uh, given in terms of restitution to the original owner is that value of the actual robbed item and not the byproduct. Fine. What's the issue? Is they you can see in the inflection of the way they phrased their rulings, the both are to knowing that it emerges in a slightly different case where the improvements developed after the robbery and are still attached to the animal. Okay? So in other words, the robber stole a shorn ewe and it grew wool well while in its possession. And now, when, when the Gomorrah uses the term, he wishes to return it to the owner before shearing it. He doesn't wish to do that. I, th I think what is meant there is that the court kind of sees the animal uh, and basically as he didn't have a chance to shave it yet because Rashi said uh, now he wishes to return it to the owner. 
So I'm not ready to see Rashi before 120 years. But if if I did, I would ask Rashi, what do you mean he's ready? He's making a profit up until this point. The court must have seized the animal because otherwise he quickly would have shaved it and kept the profit. You get what I'm saying, guys? So that's one of my questions. And then a cow that became pregnant while in the robber's possession, he had a male ox and it got it pregnant or whatever the case may be. At that stage, there wasn't really a fetal development as far as that's concerned. But even if it was pregnant while in his possession, but now it's fully um, developed fetally from almost not being pregnant, but it's still part of the animal. It hasn't given birth. That's the point at which they disagree, according to Rav Zavid. So Rabbi Yehuda says that when it's still attached to the animal, the physical improvements, it all returns to the original owner, the one who was robbed. Okay? Because how do we know this? How do we know this? Because there was a discussion where Rabbi Meir had stated in the first price that all the improvements basically go to return to the original owner, even though they underwent a physical change. In other words, the wool was shorn and the fetus was born. By rights, that physical change should cause the robber to acquire that. But we learned that Rabbi Meir penalizes the robber and considers the removed improvements as if they were still attached to the animal. And Rabbi Yehuda argues in rules that the stolen animal returns as it is. In other words, at the time the owner sues the robber in court, whether the animal has become improved or diminished, we don't view the removed improvements as if they're still attached. So rather, if the animal had been diminished since the robbery, would have been diminished, the removal of the wall or the fetus, the robber acquires through change that which has been removed and pays their prior value uh, of the wall or the fetus in cash. So that obviously goes against Rabbi Meir, but that's if it has been uh, detached. If the animal has improved since the robbery, in other words, it hasn't detached from the animal itself, it just became pregnant or the attached will has grown, then in that particular case, it's not considered where the animal has intrinsically changed significantly. Uh, do you get what I'm saying? It's it's uh, Because it's not separated, it's just maybe grown a bit of hair or it's become a bit fatter and therefore it's not a significant physical change enough to uh, warrant the, uh, the the ownership to transfer to the robber and the robber to pay the cash value, he can return that animal in that developed stage, which hasn't made significant changes of giving birth or being shorn, to the original owner. Okay, that's pretty clear. That's Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Shimon holds that they belong to the robber. So what do we mean? is that Rabbi Shimon holds us whether or not there's uh, uh, it's detached or attached. That's the point at which they argue. Because Rabbi Shimon disputes Rabbi Yehuda's ruling that the robber keeps the wool and fetus only if they became separated from the animal, but not if they're still attached. So Rabbi Shimon maintains we view it as if it was appraised with him according to its cash value at the time of the robbery. So in other words, if the ewe became laden with wool and the cow became pregnant after the robbery, uh, then even those improvements that are still attached to the animal, and obviously, certainly, if they've been removed, if all uh, Rav Yehud and Rabbi Shimon agree, but even if it's still attached, they belong to the robber because there's a physical change. Rabbi Shimon has said there's a physical change to the animal, and therefore the robber has actually acquired that change, and he has to uh, give the cash value at the appraised rate at the time of the robbery back to the original owner. It's that simple. It's that simple. And if you ask me why I'm clearer than Saturday night, is thank God Hashem uh, blessed me with some clarity. Really. So uh, uh, I hope that's abundantly clear. Clear as day, guys. It must be a lot clearer to you now. Yeah, no, it's clear. Thank you, David. Now, there's an opposing opinion, and it was so clever that Gavin thought of this, because he was he had an intuition, Gavin, um, it would have been as impressive as his intuition is, and it was pretty impressive. It would have been even more impressive if he, please God, has the health one day to back that intuition up with the right sort of uh, learning, except he just doesn't feel well. But with that intuition mixed with the proper preparation, you'll be devastating. 
uh, that you got you got to get there in health. You got to get there. So what yeah. what what was his instinct? So he was talking about listen. At the end of the day, the the rather there's some sort of compensation he should get. Gavin was saying like maybe he there was a part of him that maybe kept the uh, animal alive in some way, and it could have died or something terrible. And uh, uh, yeah, based on that particular fact, um, uh, based on that particular fact, uh, it, 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 uh, do we have to compensate the, the robber? So w what we're dealing with here is a case of Rabbi, uh, Ralph Papa, who deals with this issue, but well, in great detail, but I'm going to deal with it a bit because I'm not as smart as Ralph Papa. So all agree, according to Rav Papa, that both, when he says all agree, who does he mean? Rabbi uh, Yehuda and Rabbi Shimon, that even improvements that are still attached to the stolen article belong to the robber. So he's saying something different, that they don't disagree at, as far as that's concerned. Anything that's still attached to the stolen article still belongs to the robber. That's what he says. And here they are arguing with regard to whether the robber takes the entire improvement or only a half, a third, and a quarter. Now, bearing in mind, when you say the robber takes the improvement, he has to, uh, if he takes the, imp uh, the improvement, it means that he pays the value at the time of the robbery, but the improvement that it made through natural growth, because it's physically changed, is to the financial benefit of the robber. So he's saying, does he keep all of it? Or is a half, a third, or a quarter belonging to the robber and the rest to the original owner, the victim. So Rabbi Yehuda holds that improvements that are still attached to the stolen article belong entirely to the robber. So you can see Rav Papa is saying completely the opposite, that everything belongs to the robber, whereas Rav Zavid said that it belongs to the original owner. And here Rav Papa switches it and says Rav Shimon holds that it's only a half, a third, or a quarter that the robber takes. So what's this discussion of this half, this third, and this uh, quarter? Okay. So what we are saying is, um, obviously it's changed in its physical state, and, and it's saying that all agree that improvements attached belong to the robber is not meant, obviously, guys, in the strict sense. It's basically only Rabbi Yehuda, who, according to Rav Papa, who holds that they entirely belong to the robber, and the robber then must make the cash equivalent back to the victim. Uh, and the improvements uh, that are attached, he only has to make restitution to the victim at the time of the robbery. So if the animal improved from the time of the robbery, it is the robber that ends up profiting from the improvement. Because, again, it's fair that when the per the victim was stolen from, at the time that he was stolen, if he's compensated for that amount, that's still fair to the victim. Rabbi Meir says, no, no, there's got to be penalization. But the rest are saying, listen, he, the original owner hasn't lost out on anything. But Rabbi Shimon here, according to Rav Papa, is the more lenient opinion and says that only a half, a third, or a quarter belong to the robber. That's according to the Rashba. So moreover, according to Rabbi Shimon, they belong primarily to the one who was robbed, most of it. And it's only that he must compensate the robber according to the customary rate. What do you mean according to the customary rate? So the Rosh explains it as follows, is that when we view it as if it was appraised by him according to the cash value at the time of the robbery, it doesn't mean that the robber pays only the amount and all the appreciation uh, of that amount belongs to the robber. Because that's Rav Yudah's position, according to Rav Papa. Rather, guys, Rav Shima means that since the robber cared for the animal while it was in his position, and this is what Gavin was alluding to, we view it as if the robber had entered into some sort of arrangement, okay, be it not necessarily agreed upon by the other party, but as certainly uh, with the owner, even if it was tacitly, to care for the animal for a specified period. Of time, almost like a, a watchman, a showman. So, uh, and why? For a percentage of the produce, in other words, the wool or the offspring, etc. So, in such an arrangement, the animal is evaluated 
at the beginning of the specified period and placed with a caretaker, and that caretaker is responsible to return the evaluated animal at the end of the period. Okay? So it doesn't matter what happens to the animal. If he caretaker in the rob, in the case of the robot, cares for the animal and its offspring, and there's an improvement, he, re share, uh, he receives a share of the profits. Quarter, third, half. Why is it a quarter, third, or half? Well, it depends, guys, on the prevailing custom. Okay, because every community had a different custom. So according to Rav Papa, Rabbi Yehuda maintains that the wall fetus that developed after the robbery doesn't matter whether or not it's still attached to the animal, belongs entirely to the robber, according to Rav Papa. But Rav Shimon holds that whether or not the wall fetus is still attached to the animal, the robber can only get a caretaker share of the wall and fetus. So uh, according to local custom. So where's this board? Um, well, the Chazanish brings it in the 17th uh, at, uh, Duff of Bavakama about a percentage due to, um, and we don't know whether or not it's a rabbinic enactment or to facilitate his uh, repentance or basic law of guardianship, but uh, that's where it comes from. Okay, now, so, okay, it implies that if it gave birth, yes, he acquires the cough, but if it did not give birth, it returns to the original owner with the fetus it's carrying, uh, so that makes sense. Okay. Now, there's a slight, uh, there's a slight issue. So the Gemara is not quite happy because it says, "Look, we learned in the mission of something that seems to contradict Rav Papa." So what did we learn in our mission? If you stole a cow and it became pregnant while it was being held by the robber and it gave birth. When you and it became laden with wool while it was being held by the robber and he shared it, he pays as at the time of the uh, robbery. In, in other words, he returns only the stolen cow and you and retains the calf and the wool for himself in entirety. So that would seem um, that, okay, if it gave birth, yes, he acquires the calf. But if it didn't give birth and he returns it to the original owner with the fetus it's carrying, it works well with Rav Zavid. Why? Because he says that the improvement that is still attached to the stolen article belongs to the one who was robbed, according to Rav Yehuda. So in other words, if it hadn't given birth yet, he's not entitled to a share the robber. So that makes sense. But this is seeming to contradict that because it's saying that whether it's attached or not, uh, there's still a share that seems to be owed. So... We want to know, okay, so whose authorship is reflected in our Mishnah, which teaches that an unborn fetus is returned to the original owner. So we know, we know, the, who's who's the Mishnah authored by Gazich, by Rabbi Yehuda? So that's fine according to Rav Zavid, but according to Rav Papa, who says that even according to Rabbi Yehuda, the improvement is still attached to the stolen animal, it belongs to the robber, uh, then uh, whose authorship is reflected in the Mishnah, because you've got a contradiction now. Because here, it seems to imply uh, that the issue is uh, that uh, basically uh, all, all of it belongs uh, to the robber instead of uh, only the um, detached uh, portion. So we know it's not authored by Ravi Yehuda, uh, yeah, it seems, nor by Rabbi Shimon according to this logic. So it seems to be a little bit problematic. Okay, why? Because if the Mishnah implies that the attached will or unborn fetus is returned to the original owner, that doesn't accord with Rabbi Yehuda, who rules that it belongs to the robber. Okay? Now, we are stating this in a case of Rav Papa's example. Rav Zavid said Rabbi Yehuda is uh, uh, not saying that at all. He's saying it depends if it's detached, because uh, if it's still attached, it goes to the original owner. But if it's attached, according to Rav Papa, it belongs to the robber in its entirety. But according to Rabbi Shimon, he says the robber only retains a portion, quarter, third, half, 
And although the ruling does accord with Rabbi Meir in a certain respect, because it says, look, all improvements are returned to the original owner. You can't attribute this to Rabbi Meir either, because Rabbi Meir, if you remember, rules that all improvements, even a born calf and shorn wool, uh, they must be returned to the original owner. They're not kept by the robber. So that cancels out Rabbi Meir out of the picture in terms of the author of the Mishnah. So we want to see why the uh, contradiction, okay? Now, so the Gemara answers, well, what would Rav Papa say? Rav Papa would say to you that although that the Mishnah states that the robber keeps the uh, fetus, or wool, whatever case you're talking about, the cow or the ewe, that developed while the animal was in his possession, it's only with respect to where the animal gave birth or was short. But the same applies even if it didn't give birth or was not short. It doesn't have to explicitly state it. That's what Ralph Papa would say, because the robber pays only at the time of the robbery. Okay, and if he has to pay at that timeline, he keeps the unborn fetus and the unshorn wool for himself. He just has to pay the value in cash at the time of the robbery, but he gets to keep the animal. Does that, does that make sense? He doesn't return the animal, he gives the value. And the Mishnah states that the law that the robber acquires what developed in his possession only in the case where the animal gave birth or the shorn animal um, is, is not just talking about a case of separation. It can work with separation or where there's still attachment. But Rav Papa would say to you that the Tana in the first segment seized upon the case where the animal gave birth or was shorn. And the reason why that had to be done is because in the first segment of the Mishnah, Guys, it deals with a case of one who stole a pregnant cow or a wool-laden ewe. The Tana had to state that the cow gave birth or the ewe was shorn. Why? Because it had to teach that being born or shorn constitutes a change in the fetus of the wool so that the robber, through the physical change, acquires the calf or the shorn wool and only pays the prior value of the unborn calf and unshorn wool. That's why it has to use the detachment example. But according to Rav Papa, uh, it could have just continued and say if it was attached, the same principle applies. Except in this case, the robber keeps the actual uh, uh, animal that still has that improvement attached and just gives the cash value at the time of the robbery. That's what Ralph Papa would say to you. And it was for stylistic symmetry. But the law could be the same that uh, the, according to Ralph Papa, uh, that the mission is still authored by Rabbi Yehuda. But he just gives the cash instead of returning the animal. Am I making sense, guys? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So then the Gemara is saying, all right, so let's see if there's support for Rav Papa's understanding of the dispute between Rabbi Yehud and Rabbi Shimon. So it was taught in a Bryce, so that which accords with the understanding of Rav Papa. Rabbi Shimon says, we view it as if it were appraised in cash and placed by him uh, for a half, a third, or a quarter. Okay? So, in other words, um, it, it's saying that, uh, look, uh, we know that Rav uh, Shimon says that the appraisal is at the time of the robbery, even if the court date is uh, later. So, that is the understanding, and it does have some backup. And if you ever look, the Gemara relates from Rav Ashi uh, this incident about when they were studying in the academy of Rav Kahana, and they inquired as follows. According to Rabbi Shimon, who says that the robber takes only a half, a third, or a quarter. In other words, he gets paid like a Shomer, a guardian, and he doesn't get to keep it. He, um, he, he gets to get some profit, but he returns it to the owner, but gets some sort of share. If we want to remove him from the improvements by, satisfy, uh, by satisfying his claim and paying him a share to which he is entitled, is it with money that we remove him or, or perhaps he takes a share from the meat of the newborn calf itself? Sorry, guys, my blood sugar is a little low. So what I'm saying is, look, if the original owner wants to get uh, his... Uh, uh, his fetus back or the wool back 
is it possible to give that portion of the wool uh, to the robber? Or can you decide to keep that fetus? Say you want the entire fetus for a roast, a Sunday roast, or a Shabbos roast, or whatever the case may be. Maybe you don't. You've got five kids, and you don't want part of the animal missing to go to the robber because your dinner is going to be a little bit short of quantity. So you would rather pay the robber cash for that fetus that you roasted. Do you get what I'm saying, guys? Because you're having a Shabbos dinner. Kev, are you with me? Have so I lost so you said what? Yeah, yeah, just let me just try. You're saying. So let me uh, just repeat the last sentence. The question that Rav Ash Ashi asks in the Academy of Rav Kahn is look, okay, we understand that the robber did look after the animals, entitled to a little bit of a uh, share uh, of, of the improvement. Now, it's not that the original owner is losing out. It's an improvement, by the way. So if it's an improvement, because he could have starved the animal to death or really damaged the animal, there's no loss. So let him profit. So how does he profit? Do we say that we can give him his cash equivalent of the improvement, or does he have to have a share of the actual animal or the wool itself? So I'm using two examples. Say you need all the wool to do a jersey. Because you don't want to be stuck with two mittens and a and and a beanie, okay? But you want a proper jersey. You don't want to give some of the wool to the robber. Why? Because you're going to make two gloves and a beanie, Kevin. That's all you're going to have in winter. So we're saying, can you give the robber a bit of cash for his share and keep the full wool for yourself so that you've got a jersey and not a beanie and two gloves in the middle of winter? Or do we say with a fetus... You've got five kids and a wife, and suddenly if you lose some of the fetus, then all of a sudden, one of your kids is going to go hungry for the Shabbos meal. So can you redeem that value? Instead of giving that fetus improvement to the robber, give him the cash, and you have a proper Shabbos dinner. That's what we say. In other words, can you redeem it with cash, or does he have to get the original uh, improvement itself in its current state? Does that make sense? Okay, now, guys, yes, we've, got, we've got another nine and a half minutes left. I can see you all stuffed. So what we're going to do is instead of discussing, which we could do, how is this broke up, how is this broken up uh, and dealing with debtors, properties, and orphans and creditors, I think you guys are going to puke from exhaustion if we start yes, talking Damon. about debtors and creditors. What happens? Why don't you teach us rather, Kevin? Okay, point. but before that, I want to ask you a question. I've got, I've got and I've got something. I, I thought I, I had a thought earlier, and I forgot what I wanted to do. But I've got an idea. It's just when the shear came on, what happens if the robber refuses to get paid the money? He when he wants to keep the, he wants to keep the actual the animal the because he improved it. Uh, okay, so at the point of it is, this is the discussion I'd like to have with Rashi at 120, not now. 120, I can wait. Oh man. Uh, is that, I mean, no rush, is that I, I would say <laughs> that, that when he says that at the end of the day that, that he returns the animal and he hasn't shaved it, it doesn't make sense because he earns more profit if it's detached, according to all opinions. According to some opinions, if it's uh, detached, he loses out on keeping those improvements of the profit. Do you get what I'm saying? So the only way that he could do it of his own volition and not make money if he's a robber and still almost do it legally is to shave the animal, make sure it gave birth. He wouldn't return on the stage before it gave birth unless the court forced him. And that was my point. So at the point where the court forces him, he can't be cute anymore, cocky. He, he pretty much has to do what the court says. But there might be laws protecting him which he says no. He wants part of the wool or he wants part of the fetus. So can the original owner redeem that value in cash or does he have to give him part of the wool or part of the fetus? And that's what we're going to discuss next time. In the meantime, Kevin, teach us some Torah. Okay, so I don't think we've done anything on davening. Damon, you're uh, you did. did I do it? I mean, maybe I did it two years ago. But anyway, it doesn't. It's a refresher. So... Um, in Birkat Kohanim, so Gavin, this this actually concerns you and Damon because Damon's a lady.
Are you allowed to be Damon? You're not. Sorry. I am. Of course I am. Your voice is mixed. So Damon and Gavin, so Arthur and Arthur are Australian, but you two are the, the, the are from the royalty, even though Arthur is King Arthur anyway. So yeah, out of a confusing list. Yeah, it's very really confusing. <laughs> okay, so it says here to feel uh, for Birkat Kohanim. Um, one thing about a, a, a Kohen is, um, if he's going to be duchening for. Uh, for uh, for the community, like and in South Africa, it's only on on the Chagim. It's only in Musaf, Israel. It's every day Shachrit, and 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 Shabbos Shachrit and Musaf. So, if there's someone that you don't like, and let's say you, uh, someone is a Kohen. I don't want to say any prison company excluded yet. If so, if if a Kohen is going to daven for the Kehila, and he doesn't particularly like somebody get on with it or get on with them he should actually recuse himself of of, of uh, he shouldn't actually be uh, uh bless the the kegila because he he doesn't actually like a certain person that that's like when you get the, every morning like a, when i go to shakrit yeah well when I, when I go in the morning it's not every morning the guy that the coin is such a guru everyone likes him and he likes me so i don't have a problem so but I've heard that the Kohen shouldn't actually talk on them if well, there's a certain true. individual in the minion that who happens to be there on that day, he, he shouldn't because if he ha ha hates him or dislikes him, then he's not he doesn't he wouldn't really want to bless such a person. Have you heard that before, Damon? Well, it pretty much preclude me from, from my schools. It's a problem. Man. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so and uh and actually, in the davening in Shacharit in the mornings, when in the brachot, you actually say all those things. You say without even in, 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 when you do the the the, the morning brachas uh, before the main ones, you, the, you, the, in between the Torah ones and the main ones about uh, not not making you a woman or not making you a person of another faith. I'm using my words politically uh, correctly, Adam. Um, yeah, that's good. In, in between that, you actually have the Birkat Kohanim. If you look at your sin, it says, and then it's Shalom. You actually say it to yourself. So uh, um, that's that's what I wanted to say, because it's, but it's actually, yeah, you're getting blessed by somebody who's actually like Gavin. Uh, unfortunately, one day I'll be in the shul with Gavin will bless us, Simon. We'll be in a, a Musaf service and we'll get the blessing from our holy friend here. And uh, I, I may next year all at the wall. Though. I'll I'll talk yeah. at the wall for you guys. Okay. All right. As long as you're not off the wall, Gavin. At your wedding and at Damon's wedding. All right. And at your wedding, Damon will all bless you. All right. All right. Well, unless we unless we find three twins, then that'll be sort us all three out. Three twins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Triplets. You mean? Triplets. Yeah. Triplets. Sorry. 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 So that, I'm, you, not even that I'm not even that tired. I don't know why I said that. Sorry. Have I you mean, heard that before, Gavin? About that one shouldn't do it if there's someone. Uh, uh, but but I've always normally got a slight problem with like one or two people. But like I don't hate them. Like I want to kill them. So uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I understand your point, but I think it's very difficult. In, like in 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 a lot of like especially like in a bigger show like mine, there's always a couple of people that yeah, of course, it's, you can't. Uh, yeah. It's very difficult. I can't really, I think, I don't think it's necessary for me to uh, preclude myself. Because I knew a guy um, from a certain shul. If you absolutely hate somebody and you want to absolutely kill that person, there is no one in the shul that that I ever feel that way. I knew uh, a Kohen from a certain shul. And a certain, I'm not mentioning, uh, it could be a certain shul in Joburg, who actually disliked someone really. He actually, he would have clapped the oak if he could have. And he was the Kohen. But he's still different. He uh he he didn't uh, recuse himself. No, so I don't really feel like clapping those guys. I'm not at that point. So I'm all right, I think. Yeah. yeah. So right. uh, uh, Gav, listen. Gav, uh, yeah. Don't uh, don't uh, listen. I'm just feeling a little unwell. Don't pick me up. Um, because you're you, gonna need you, to. You, you're cutting out, Damon. You're cutting out. I'll give you a call. <laughs> 